<laughs> okay, we're going to talk about the fisheries in the Sargasso Sea, then tell you about the fishing equipment used in the Sargasso Sea and the fisheries in Bermuda's exclusive, exclusive economic zone. We'll then discuss the existing governance and conclude with our management recommendations. So as we've heard about, the Sargasso Sea is a very important ecosystem. It's a major source of fish for fisheries across the globe. As an area of beyond national jurisdiction, however, there are inherent regulation difficulties that can lead to unsustainable fishing practices. So state of fish stocks, who really cares? <laughs> so this isn't really something you discuss casually, or at least I've been informed you shouldn't. Um, anyone who eats fish though, or is concerned with conserving fish for future generations, should be paying attention to fish stocks. The Sargasso Sea in particular hosts many well-known fish species, some of which are at risk due to overfishing. For example, the Atlantic bluefin tuna. The Atlantic bluefin tuna, not only are these massive fish incredibly beautiful and important for marine ecosystems, but they are incredibly delicious. These highly sought after fish, which can grow to over 10 feet in length, are arguably the most economically valuable fish in the world. Currently, they sell for hundreds of thousands of dollars per fish, which breaks down to around $1,200 per pound. The Atlantic bluefin tuna fish stocks have been declining for decades due to the demand for these fish. This is due to slow growth and maturing at a late age, combined with advancement in fishing gear and techniques. These make Atlantic bluefin tuna an unsustainable fish stock and have led to their current status as an endangered species on the International Union for the Conservation of Nature, or the IUCN Red List. In addition to the Atlantic bluefin tuna, there are two other notable fish species in the Sargasso Sea that are declining due to overfishing, albacore tuna and marlin. Atlantic bluefin tuna and albacore are both managed by the International Commission for the Conservation of Atlantic Tuna, also known as ICAT. However, um, they're not being managed to the extent that they should be because they are both still declining fish stocks. Marlin, on the other hand, is only managed as bycatch through ICAT. This is a challenge as marlin are at risk due to overfishing from recreational fisheries and are therefore not managed by any organization. Marlin are an interesting case as recreational fisheries are not really considered when discussing management of fish stocks. So in addition to the species I just discussed, there are other highly fished species in the Sargasso Sea, including other species of tuna, such as skipjack and um, the yellowfin depicted here, wahoo and swordfish, all of which are highly migratory species, which make them dif difficult to monitor and manage. So Venezuela and Mexico have the highest landed fish values in the Sargasso Sea. However, they fish um, Spanish mackerel, which is concentrated around the Caribbean EEZ and the Sargasso Sea border, and they're not really part of the Sargasso Sea ecosystems and are therefore not discussed when deciding Sargasso Sea conservation efforts. So if you exclude Venezuela and, um, and Mexico, Japan and the United States are the other top two nations fishing in the Sargasso Sea, and they're also the top two nations that fish Atlantic bluefin tuna. In fact, Japan consumes three-fourths of the world's Atlantic bluefin tuna catches. So now that I've discussed um, the at-risk fish species in the Sargasso Sea, I'm going to turn to the fish stocks that should be fished. So the sustainable fisheries are yellowfin tuna and mahi-mahi. Um, they are quick growing and they mature at a young age, which means that they replenish their stocks no matter how quickly we fish them out of the sea. Um, and we can work towards sustainable fisheries by focusing our efforts on creating sustainable fishing practices, which leads to our next topic, the fishing gear used in the Sargasso Sea and the challenges associated with these fishing gear types. So, like Kelly implied, I will be talking about fishing gear and the equipment used in Sargasso Sea. I'll be starting off by use, talking about four commercially, uh, commercially used gear types. They are long lines, gill nets, purse seine nets, and bottom trawling. I'll start out with the long line just to give a quick description of <laughs> each. Long lines, as the name implies, is the long main line with uh, branching baited lines at certain at set intervals that hang uh, vertically in the water. Then you got uh, gill nets, which once again, as the name implies, are large mesh nets that have size or has mesh with certain sizes that allow fish to get their gills and other body parts such as fins caught in them. 
You also have per se nets, which are large nets that are deployed with two different uh, boats that surround and encapsulate fish, which are then hauled into the boats. But before I move on to bottom trawling, I like to talk about the major stressor that I like to focus on with these three main topics, which are bycatch, which is an overarching term that is the um, unintentional catching of certain species or of certain sizes of a species when you're aiming for a different species or the same species, depending on when it's a targeted size. Um, for long lines, uh, these mainly include uh, uh, many bird species such as albatrosses, dolphins, sea turtles, and other species similar to that. Um, for gill nets, sorry, uh, they actually, including many of the species I said before, also have the potential to harm large macrofauna such as whales. A study done in or between 1980 and 2002 found or uh, examined 70 or examined uh, right whales in the Atlantic North Atlantic Ocean and found that 75 percent of them have scarring from being either entangled in nets or in long lines, which is very surprising, being that large of a number. And for per se nets, um, many of the uh, fauna that are caught as bycatch are usually predatory animals such as dolphins and other main predatory fish and mammals in the sea. But I'll go on to my next and last fishing equipment I will talk about, which is bottom trawling, which is a style or a gear type that is dragged along the bottom of the seafloor that is capturing anything within its open mouth. It, along with bycatch, I really want to focus in on its devastation to the seafloor. And especially in the Sargasso Sea, this would be uh, sea mounts. They are not heavily used in the Sargasso Sea, but they are still used. And we will that will be talked about before about regulations that deal with this. But this also has to factor in as well with Bermuda and its fishing because it's also legal there. And I'll pass it on to Liz, who will talk about Bermuda fishing. Thanks, Ryan. So um, Bermudian fisheries much resemble the rest of the fisheries within the Sargasso Sea, just kind of at a much smaller scale. Um, this is a graph depicting commercial landing values by tons from within Bermuda's EEZ, and this is only fish caught by Bermuda. Um, EEZ is the zone extending 200 miles off, 200 nautical miles off the coastline of Bermuda. Um, the two species that are fished most heavily are the wahoo and the yellowfin tuna, um, each accounting uh, when combined for about 30% of the total catch within Bermuda's EEZ. having a malfunction. <laughs> um, so this figure shows landed value in tons from within the Sargasso Sea during the year 2006. Red areas on the graph, like here and here, uh, are areas of very high landed value, and blue, the dark blue, is very low landed value. Um, note that this graph is only really covering the year 2006. Um, it's really the only data that we could find, which kind of just highlights the need for better fisheries monitoring. Um, I want everyone to notice the big blue gap that is Bermuda's EEZ. You can see the, the green in the center is area of medium landed value, but there's really not much fishing going around or going on in this outer EEZ, um, as uh, I think it was Billy Causey explained, or actually, I'm sorry, as our governance uh, uh, presentation explained um, with the Blue Halo project. So given that information, it might now be obvious that Bermuda's EEZ is not their primary source of seafood. Uh, in fact, 75% of their seafood is imported from other countries. There are a few reasons um, contributing to this dependency. One of them is that the island is 21 square miles, uh, but is home to 65,000 people, and they see up to 10 times that much tourist traffic every year. Um, so that's a lot of mouths to feed, 650,000 people. Uh, demand for all types of food is very high, let alone seafood. And that's a really big food security problem for Bermuda. Uh, a local told me when our class was in Bermuda that he'd heard an estimate Bermuda would only last two weeks on their current food supply if all shipping to the island were suddenly halted. Um, as I mentioned earlier, Bermuda's essentially got 200 nautical miles around them that they're not using to fish. So could this be a management problem? Let's hear from Sarah about fisheries management to find out. Thanks. 
All right. Uh, so we've heard about declining fish stocks, and we've heard about destructive fishing practices. To improve both of these, oh, this is really not working. Uh, <laughs> um, to improve both these situations, management is critical. And that's not only to protect the species and the habitats, but also to, um, to support the sustainable, sustainable human use, such as fishing. And this is a fact that I think is often forgotten when talking about fisheries management, which is not always about restricting catch limits, restricting catches, or creating no catch zones or moratoriums on fishing, but more about ensuring that fisheries remain productive for years to come. So this is particularly problematic in the high seas where any sort of management has to emerge through international cooperation. And the primary mechanism for these is our regional fisheries management organizations. Uh, there are four regional fisheries management organizations in the Sargasso Sea. Um, I will talk about these all in more detail, but right now I'll just point out where they are. There is one in the southern Sargasso Sea, two up here in the north, and one that covers the entire region. Um, two of these are management bodies. Two of these are only advisory bodies that can only propose regulations and advise their constituents on proper strategies. Uh, two of these are species specific and focus in on one particular species or group of species, while the other two are more broad and manage all st fish stocks in a given area. So I will start by talking about, still isn't working, all right, the International Commission for the Conservation of Atlantic Tunas, otherwise known as ICAT. So you've already heard a little bit about this today because it's probably the most well-known organization in the region and also the most widespread. It covers the entire Atlantic Ocean and therefore the entire Sargasso Sea. And it's notable because it's the only fisheries management organization to do so. Um, it focuses only on tuna and tuna-like species. But while this may seem limited, tuna is, as it's, we've already mentioned, it's highly migratory. So it's actually better protected by this really large but more singularly focused area than a smaller area that can protect more species. And tuna is also one of the most economically important fish species. And it's, ICAT is particularly important because the Atlantic bluefin tuna, as we've heard, is at risk and has to be highly regulated through ICAT. But however, we've also found over the past 12 weeks, we found ICAT to be incredibly relevant to the Sargasso Sea in general. Um, while we were trying to create this management plan, we were always having this, these discussions about which organization we can work through to actually implement our recommendations. And ICAT came up in almost every discussion. And so although it's only focused on tuna, it has um, things in place to protect everything from sargassum to seamounts, and has been incredibly useful in this. Part of the reason for this, no thank you, can you go back? <laughs> Part of the reason for this incredibly broad impact is because it is a management body and is able to both enforce and implement regulations, which isn't true for all of these bodies. It has been criticized for setting catch limits too high, but in recent years it's beginning to hopefully improve in this. All right. So <laughs> the next organization is located in the northern Sargasso Sea, um, in the North Atlantic, sorry, and covers only the very northern edge of the Sargasso Sea. Um, this is the North Atlantic Salmon Conservation Organization. And sorry, these are all going to have very long <laughs> and hard to pronounce names. Sorry. Um, like ICAT, it only focuses on one particular species. I can tell by the name salmon. It prohibits the fishing of salmon in the North Atlantic. But it is only an advisory body, and so it can only propose regulations and doesn't have any enforcement power, which explains its more limited impact in the Sargasso Sea. The next organization is the Northwest Atlantic Fisheries Organization, um, which is, unlike the previous two organizations, it protects all fish stocks in the given area. And it protects, it's basically in the same place, it stretches a little further into the Sargasso Sea. It has several notable aspects. Um, it is a management body, and it has implemented an ecosystem approach to fisheries management by expanding beyond a focus just on fishery resources by committing to protect the associated marine ecosystems from the adverse effects of fisheries. It has also tackled the inherent difficulty of high seas enforcement by implementing a vessel monitoring system. And the final organization is located in the Southern Sargasso Sea, and it's the Western Central Atlantic Fisheries Commission. And this is um, not species specific, but it is only an advisory body, so it has limited impact. Um, so these overlapping jurisdictions have created a pretty fragmented system of governance. Um, and individually, none of these organizations protect all fish stocks for the entire Sargasso Sea. But together they do. So therefore, increased cooperation and coordination between them is key to the next step of protecting, improving fisheries management in the Sargasso Sea. 
In Bermuda, the situation is a little different. Bermuda's fisheries regulations are decided by the Marine Resources Board, which is based off of three foundational documents. Uh, the Fisheries Act of 1972 acts as parent legislation and codifies the right of the government to manage their EEZ, allowing them to, um, to oh, sorry, allowing them to declare, declare protected areas and restrict the catch of certain species. Um, the, these the specific regulations are laid out in the next document in the Fisheries Regulations of 2010. And the last document lists the protected areas in Bermuda's EEZ, which are mostly established to conserve Bermuda's history, as most are located around shipwrecks and do not have any ecological basis behind them. So with this background, we were able to come up with a set of recommendations for managing and protecting fisheries in the Sargasso Sea, both in the high seas and in Bermuda's EEZ. Okay, first we're going to talk about the recommendations we have for the high seas of the Sargasso Sea. So like we've talked about before, we have two seamount areas that we have designated for protection, the New England and the Corner Rise seamounts. Um, so seamounts, as we've also discussed, are vulnerable to disturbances, particularly to bottom tra tra trawling, as discussed by Ryan. Um, there is currently a moratorium on bottom trawling on these two areas mandated by the Northwest Atlantic Fisheries Organization, which is set to expire this year, 2015. We, we are recommending that this moratorium be extended into the future. In addition, we are recommending a seasonal closure during April and May to all fishing of tuna and tuna-like species in these areas. This is in an effort to help replenish the Atlantic bluefin tuna fish stocks because studies have shown that Atlantic bluefin tuna are concentrated in higher numbers in the Sargasso Sea during these months. And we know that seamounts are areas of high productivity and fish often congregate in these areas, which is why we have designated these as the closure areas. So fishing techniques. As Ryan discussed, bycatch is one of the main concerns in commercial fisheries. And we are recommending implementing the use of fishing gear that minimizes bycatch as, and is more targeted to specific species. An example of this is long-line long equipment made with hooks that unbend and release the animal caught if the animal is outside the weight limit of what you are targeting. This would be implemented through ICAT and other interested organizations by creating buyback programs that would buy old fishing gear from fishermen who would then be able to buy the newer gear types that would target fish species. So when organizations determine catch limits, they use um, reported catches as the principal data to figure out an appropriate catch limit. Illegal fishing can be highly detrimental to fish stocks because while organizations like ICAT try to take into account these illegal fishing activities, they're only estimating and do not actually have an accurate estimate of the fish stocks being taken out of the ocean, which can lead to catch limits being set too high to conserve the fish stocks. So in order to combat illegal fishing, we recognized that there needed to be some sort of monitoring system. And our initial idea was to have um, a mandatory monitoring system for fishing vessels that would need to report suspicious activity. However, when we were at sea, we saw a fishing vessel that looked suspicious, and we realized that in that situation, in the middle of the ocean, having to report a vessel that could, <laughs> like that could make an unsafe situation for the fishermen in that situation. So instead we recommend implementing a satellite-based monitoring system that would be implemented by Interpol's Fisheries and Crime Working Group and the IMO. I will turn it over now to Liz to discuss our recommendations for Bermuda's waters. Thanks, Callie. I'll discuss the recommendations for Bermuda's waters with you. Um, in 2010, the government of Bermuda published a document called A Strategy for the Sustainable Use of Bermuda's Living Marine Resources, which outlines various ways in which Bermuda could decrease their dependency on imported seafood. One of the suggestions was to encourage the growth of aquaculture industries for species like mahi-mahi or bivalves because they're fast-growing, sustainable, and delicious. A second strategy proposed by the 2010 document is the safe capture and consumption of the invasive lionfish. Now, as my colleague Margaret discussed in an earlier presentation about stresses on biodiversity, lionfish are a huge problem for reefs in Bermuda and the Caribbean. They're really the poster child for invasive species. Um, they're highly poisonous, they're top predators, voracious predators, um, but aside from their highly poisonous spines, they're pretty edible, um, and when prepared safely and properly, uh, make for a great meal. Nonprofits like the Reef Environmental Education Foundation are already working on the campaign to get lionfish on the table in the Caribbean via cookbooks and other public education outreach um, experiences. 
Bermuda already has a lionfish task force, as Margaret said, dedicated to stopping the spread of lionfish as well. Lastly, the proposal team recommends the implementation of shoreside facilities. Plans for these were outlined in the 2010 strategy, but unfortunately never came to fruition because of budget limitations. At these shoreside facilities, fishermen would be able to store excess catch until it is needed in the market. This is especially relevant to Bermudian fisheries because many of the top fishery targets, like the wahoo and tuna and yellowfin tuna mentioned earlier, are only seasonally available because of their migration patterns. The shoreside facilities would also serve as a data collection point to benefit fisheries research. That concludes our Fisheries in the Sargasso Sea presentation. I thank you for your attention, and I will now open it up to questions.
throughout the day we've heard the phrase tuna and tuna-like fishes. Mm -hmm. uh, can you give us a precise definition of tuna-like? <laughs> <laughs> so I think that's something that I kind of came up with, and it includes um, billfish, which are you know, marlin and swordfish, um, and wahoo, and then, then, then obviously just the species of tuna. Okay. So it's, it's something that I kind of came up with to define. It's a suborder. So my question on, uh, my question pertaining to that is, you said something about the seasonal closure of tuna and tuna-like fishes around seamounts in April and May. Mm -hmm. You said there's large aggregations. Was breeding aggregations? They're not. Um, so why the aggregations and not closure during breeding season? So, so breeding is, uh, actually occurs in the Mediterranean and the Gulf of Mexico. Good answer. So it's <laughs> <laughs> And then we think that the, the like high concentration that we're seeing could be the migration group. Did you want to? I was I was just gonna say um, the data that we had for this um, was pretty much uh, the only data available it was a um, study done on 172 Atlantic bluefin tuna that were tracked moving west to east um, from the from their breeding grounds in the Gulf of Mexico to the Mediterranean. Um, it's it from the data it was very clear that there were aggregations in April and May that actually happened to be around the seamounts. Um, but they, they do not breed the bill, sorry, SEC. <laughs> Doesn't happen. Thank you very much, Mr. Fisher.